Hello and welcome to seminar number four in this COVID-19 seminar series, co-hosted by the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization and the Deakin Science and Society Network. My name is Tao Fan and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute and I'll be chairing today's incredibly timely discussion on trust, transparency and COVID treatment, sorry, and contact tracing apps with data and privacy expert, Dr. Monique Mann. I'd like to begin this session by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm standing, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledge the Indigenous traditional owners of the places that you are all listening from. Now, if you're joining us live, please do feel free to introduce yourself on the YouTube chat. Um, as with the other seminars in this series, we'll be running the Q&A component using the chat function. So if you have any questions for discussion, please post them in the chat and my colleague Emma Cobbile, who is moderating today, will pass them on to us. Tim Neal, who's also part of the SSN, uh, will also be live tweeting the event. And if you'd like to ask any questions via Twitter, use the hashtag SSN Seminar. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Monique Mann is a senior lecturer in criminology <clears throat> and member of the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization at Deakin University. Dr. Mann's research expertise concerns three main interrelated lines of inquiry, new technology for policing and surveillance, human rights and social justice, and governance and regulation. She's contributed to advancing Australia's national research agenda in these areas through activities not only as an academic and author, but also as an advocate, media commentator and policy advisor. She's the author of Politicising and Policing Organised Crime, Biometrics, Crime and Security, and editor of Good Data. She's also on the board of directors of the Australian Privacy Foundation, where she chairs the Surveillance Committee. Welcome, Monique. Hello, Tao. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. I also wish to begin by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land, air and sea in which I live and work and broadcast this talk uh, from. I wish to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging in full recognition that sovereignty of First, Na First Nations people has never been ceded. I would like to thank you, Tao, and also Emma and the SSN uh, ADI team um, more broadly for inviting me to give this talk, organizing and moderating this virtual discussion. Very interestingly, the first time that I've held a seminar like this uh, via Zoom and broadcast to YouTube. So in terms of the scope of the talk I'll give today, I'm going to focus specifically on the Australian context. I'm going to overview some of the legal and technical critiques that have been made in relation to the COVID Safe app. And then I'm going to depart from this by focusing specifically on mounting uh, a critical surveillance studies critique as aligned with the aims of Deakin SSN uh, and my own expertise that seeks to set these developments in a broader context. And I believe this will add a different perspective to other voices that have been uh, active in the developments as they've unfolded very rapidly over the previous few weeks. So my aim really is to question and consider the role of technology as implicated in the governance of biosecurity and point towards some of the socio-political, structural and justice issues that I consider relevant and important. So from the outset of this talk, and I think it's really important that I say this up front, uh, I want to be clear that I will not take a position on whether people should or should not download the app. I believe that this is a decision that individuals should make for themselves with regard to their own specific circumstances. And indeed the use of this application in the Australian context, at least currently, um, with recognition that this, this does differ internationally, is voluntary. And that's important and uh, that we respect individuals' own decisions uh, to download and use this app or not. So on that note, I will get um, started with an outline of my talk today. I do have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm gonna first briefly overview the COVID Safe app, some of the associated campaigns that have been designed to increase the rate of uptake or downloads of the app in the community. I'm then going to look at some of the main legal and technical critiques that have been highlighted since the app was released. I'm going to think or reflect upon some of the critical open letters and calls that have been made to address uh, some of the issues. Uh, and these have been made by interested civil society groups and also technical, legal and academic experts. I'm going to consider um, the central issue or something that's really been raised, I think, a lot in discourse and debate around this topic, which is the release of the source code. And that's really tended to dominate these critiques and calls. 
And so then I'm going to situate this focus within the critical literature specifically on transparency and in particular algorithmic transparency, drawing from developments and arguments that have, we've seen um, over the previous years in relation to the field, a distinct but I think also related field of artificial intelligence, algorithms and automated decision making. So while the context differ here, uh, I think there's an opportunity to learn from some of these arguments that have been presented in relation to transparency in this context and apply them or connect them to the sorts of arguments we're seeing in relation to the COVID Safe app. This will then lead me to consider arguments in relation to techno determinism and solutionism, uh, arguments for decentering technology, and then point towards broader issues of social and data justice, which I believe deserve greater attention than what's been paid uh, in the, the commentary that I've seen uh, thus far. In doing so, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to situate all of this in a broader context of COVID-19 surveillance developments, but also a recent history of Australian surveillance architectures. I don't think we can view these separately. And then I'm going to conclude with some reflections on what all this means, so what, uh, and where we should perhaps be focusing future attention uh, and debate. So a bit of background here on the COVID Safe, COVID Safe app. Uh, the Australian government released a contact tracing application very recently, uh, the 26th of April. This happened on a Sunday to assist in the response to the global pandemic, to speed up the process of uh, contact tracing of individuals. So the app involves an initial collection of personal data, including mobile phone data, name, a pseudonym, um, uh, is able to be provided, age range, postcode, uh, and then provided that the app is operational and an individual's phone and Bluetooth is active, and I'll come back to that point, it then records contact data, which consists of an encrypted user ID, date and time of contact and Bluetooth signal strength of other COVID safe users that an individual comes into contact with. Uh, if an individual tests positive for COVID-19, then a health official will request consent to upload contact data on the device into a national data store for the purposes of contact tracing. So it's important to note that the objective of the app is to support, that is make more efficient and not replace contact tracing by health officials. So with, my, with respect to my inverted commas earlier, while the app is termed COVID safe, uh, I have some concerns about the misleading branding and marketing of this app. Uh, and indeed we've seen Scott Morrison um, commenting, it's like wearing sunscreen. Uh, I would really question, well, is this going to keep you safe from COVID? Will it result in unintended consequences such as people not taking additional precautions or engaging in protective behaviours such as hand washing, for example? And these really remain open empirical questions. Um, research in this area is only very recently and rapidly emerging, aligned with the very quick developments here. Um, we've seen recent surveys, for example, published in the conversation a couple of days ago, some of the initial results published in the conversation a few days ago. Uh, by people such as Simon Dennis at Melbourne University, who published um, um, some initial results around people's understandings and motivations for downloading the app. Um, and there, there are quite some interesting findings that are emerging. So for example, 40% of individuals surveyed uh, did not understand that the app actually used Bluetooth, but rather thought that the app was relying on um, location data, mobile phone towers, or did not understand actually how it operated. So again, um, some issues here. Importantly, as I mentioned at the outset of the talk, the use of the app is voluntary, not mandatory. That has been witnessed in other countries where individuals are required to use uh, contact tracing or geolocational monitoring technologies. Although I do note that initially the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Paul Kelly, uh, would not rule out the app becoming mandatory, stating to the media on the 17th of April, and I'm quoting, I think we start with voluntary and see how that goes. So there are also some issues, and I know we discussed this yesterday, Tao, uh, in relation to suggestions of some employers or some companies developing their own separate contact tracing applications and requiring employees to use them, as we've seen with um, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, uh, and, uh, and others. Um, this differs from the COVID Safe app, but it's also a concern, I think, in relation to other coercive surveillance techniques.
So the Australian government has stated that they've estimated about that approximately 40% of the Australian population would need to have the app, to download the app onto their phones for it to be effective in achieving its public health uh, aims um, bef and before restrictions can be eased. Uh, this was later revised to 40% of those who have smartphones. It's also worth noting that the 40% figure for the app to be kind of effective in achieving its objectives uh, has been debated and questioned with uh, some arguing that uptake rates actually need to be much higher and it's not really clear what information is informing this figure so there's um, some, I think some uncertainty about this. Uh, there is a direct and, and I think at times quite overt connection that's been made uh, by the Australian government, um, by Scott Morrison, um, between uh, the downloading and the uptake of this app in the community and the easing of restrictions. These are also, these arguments are also being, pr being presented alongside economic arguments and the need to reopen the Australian economy and the cost, uh, the, the financial cost of what the, the lockdown uh, is, is costing us. So the Australian approach has somewhat been based on the Trace Together app in Singapore. This app experienced poor uptake rates um, for it to be effective at ach achieving its stated objectives. And so given this, there has been a campaign um, by a number of businesses and individuals um, being involved to endorse COVID Safe to increase the uptake of the app. Um, and encouraging individuals to download the app. And you can visit their campaign page at endorsecovidsafe.com. So the focus on uptake is important because it goes directly to the issue of efficacy uh, of the app in achieving public health objectives. And also we need to remember that this is essentially we're, we're in, the, in, in the, the heart of a large scale social experiment. So this image is taken for or from the Endorse COVID Safe app campaign website. And it compares the uptake of the app in Australia with that of Singapore um, at various points in times from when the app was released. So the trend shows when the app was first released, there was a large number of individuals downloading the app, but then this uh, tapers off with time. So you see the download, the COVID Safe download curve is flattening. Uh, it shows that out of, out of the 13th of May, so a few days ago, uh, there were 5.6 million or about 30% of smartphone users uh, in Australia. It's, I think it's estimated that about 20 million Australians have smartphones um, who have the app. So this is more than the up uptake that we've, we saw in Singapore, but it, but it still remains below the 40% mark. So I, I, I wanted to present current data during this talk today about how many people have downloaded uh, the app, but it's really difficult to find. There isn't, in terms of the searches that I've conducted, this information presented in one sort of government website. Um, someone on Twitter did post to me uh, a link collating media statements where the government have released media statements. I mean, the most recent figures uh, from AAP uh, show that around 5.7 million people have um, downloaded the app as at 17 May, so two days ago. Um, but I think it's important that, to note that this information is being reported in media, not on one government kind of location website to be able to monitor the number of downloads at any given time. So it's uh, quite difficult to follow. And I think that's an issue in and of itself, actually, the reporting here. And I do imagine that if numbers of downloads were higher, rather than what we're seeing with the download curve flattening, that would probably be publicised um, by the government. So I also just wanted to be a bit critical here though. With that said, the number of downloads does not actually represent the number of people who are using the, the app correctly or whether, you know, to question whether or not downloads are actually the best measure of efficacy in terms of response, even though the focus has very much been on this, trying to get people to download the app. Um, I think, and I'll come to these points further soon, um, especially as individuals could download and then delete the app or could download the app and have Bluetooth deactivated or download the app and leave their phone at home. So app downloads, I think, is but one measure. Uh, and, I, and I think this suggests that there should be a greater range or a greater focus on other evidence being used to inform decision making regarding the easing of restrictions. Um, I would also highlight while we know, you know, somewhat to some extent the number of downloads uh, that have occurred uh, there's 
uh, I think a range of other important information that's not being made available. So for example, the postcodes of where people are downloading the app. And I think this would enable assessment of some intersecting factors, um, such as use in perhaps socially or economic, economically disadvantaged locations, um, especially with consideration of rural or regional areas. Um, that are more so impacted by the digital divide. And that's also a point that I'll return to later in the talk. Okay, so this has been happening very quickly and uh, Graham Greenleaf and Catherine Kemp from UNSW Law uh, have published a series of very comprehensive uh, work in progress drafts. They've published them on SSRN, they're available open access on the, the legal framework as it's been evol rapidly evolving. And so I would refer interested listeners to their work. Um, and they've also written um, publicly accessible um, kind of analyses of, of this on, for the conversation as well. So they for overview in their kind of first work in progress draft, there's three, um, the biosecurity de determination, subsequently the exposure draft of the COVID safe bill, the bill, which was then subsequently passed into law. And this happened within a space of two to three weeks. So very fast moving in states of emergency and all credit to Graham and Catherine for being so on top of this, especially in the current context. Um, but I also noted states of emergency as we see with things happening very quickly and also with full bi bipartisan support. Laws can be quickly introduced, they can be quickly changed, they can be quickly amended. They're not set in stone. So I would just kind of uh, mention that. But the framework now that we have, um, the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Act covers the conditions for the operation or establishes the legal framework for the operation of the COVID Safe app. In, res in, re in response to this, um, Greenleaf and Camp raise a number of issues. They outline, I think, it's six issues of transparency, um, but some other con serious concerns as well, uh, especially in relation to the need for ongoing evaluation of the app um, and its efficacy in achieving its stated objectives uh, by independent uh, scientific experts. And they argue that the release or, or the results of such independent studies by scientific experts should be disclosed transparently, as should the evidence uh, informing the justification of the development and deployment of the app, which has not occurred. Uh, they argue for the publication of periodic independent scientific ass assessments, that the app is achieving its stated objectives in protecting public health. Um, and that's important because that supports the assessment that the incursion into individual privacy is indeed proportionate and necessary to the stated aims. They also raise a series of other concerns around some of the misconceptions that the Australian government have uh, fueled uh, in relation to um, the information that the app is actually collecting in relation to proximity and duration of uh, contact. The Australian government have very much put forward um, this is 1.5 metres for 15 minutes in terms of the contact being uh, recorded um, and what information the app, app, app actually collects is that much broader and actually concerns all other devices within a Bluetooth range that have the app installed regardless of the duration of contact. Uh, they quite powerfully argue that this is an over collection of personal information which is not required for the purposes of contact tracing. They also highlight a series of loopholes in protections against coercion to use the app, including in relation to discriminatory or preferential treatment for having the app uh, installed. So for example, you might go to the hairdressers and get a discount on your cut and color if you have the app installed, um, or, and also the installation of the app on a phone that is owned by an employer uh, rather than the user, for example. And indeed this connects to the point uh, I mentioned just previously in relation to employers developing their own apps uh, as we've seen uh, with PwC. So there are a few outstanding issues, I think, from the legal perspective, um, but there are also a range of issues or critiques that have been mounted from a technical design and deployment perspective. So in addition to those legal critiques, um, there are a range of other concerns, um, issues have emerged or questions have emerged, I should say, in relation to the use of Amazon Web Services and the potential for US authorities to request Amazon provide data um, under kind of the um, Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act. I think these questions remain unresolved and there's certainly a requirement for further kind of comprehensive analysis here, particularly given how complicated um, the jurisdictional issues are and so forth. 
Uh, there are also possible failures, so such as issues we've seen with iPhones that they're now releasing updates to address. Um, I, I really love this cartoon that was recently published in the, the Saturday paper. You know, individuals may forget their phone, their phone may not be charged. Um, and I think actually going back to that issue of uh, Amazon involvement, I think this also shows that surveillance infrastructures themselves are not free and there are investments in them, and particularly investments by private companies. Uh, and again, highlighting the significant role of US tech companies here. Uh, so my colleague and friend uh, also at UNSW, Monica Zalnuetti, made some uh, recent comments in Gizmodo, uh, and I'll quote Monica here, the dependency of the world governments on US infrastructural data empire becomes apparent when you realise that the US government you know, can access data from most contact tracing apps around the world easier than the very governments running them. And I think you know, that kind of also highlights some issues in, rela in relation to you know, US imperialism, US legal imperialism, US technology company imperialism in many ways. Uh, there are also issues um, we've seen with Bluetooth accuracy, false positives and fa false negatives. And some concerns have been raised around the uploading of information to a national data store. Um, so the contact data remains on the phone in the event that a positive uh, COVID uh, result is obtained, it's then uploaded to a centralised national data store. That's where decryption occurs. Um, however, there is a possibility here of a more decentralised design, and that's been pursued by others, in particular Google and Apple, um, with their privacy preserving contact tracing. And I find that interesting as well, that we have Google and Apple uh, coming in to build um, a, a perhaps a more privacy preserving contract tracing uh, approach than the state. But again, I think also raises important questions about the role of tech companies in all of this. Okay, so with all of those issues in mind, <laughs> there were a series of open letters and called, calls made by interested parties. Again, noting that this has been moving very, very, very quickly. And the first was um, made by the Australian Privacy Foundation. The Privacy Foundation issued an initial media release on the 22nd of May, so before the app was released, and then issued an updated version once the COVID Safe app was released on the 27th of May. And this open call called for four things the publication of design specifications, so many more than just five eyes can check them for effectiveness and vulnerabilities and assess whether they're best practice privacy by design, to conduct an open independent privacy impact assessment, PIA, consulting not just public service and security interests, but appropriate representatives of the public interest from health, privacy, civil liberties, research and technical perspectives before the prototype or before the app is released, the technical details should be published, including the source code, data model and communication protocols to help review conformance with design and to squash bugs. And to do all of this, the fourth thing, to do all of this before the release of the app, so serious concerns can be addressed. So the app was released, uh, the design specifications were not released, uh, the privacy impact assessment was released with the app at the same time as the app, not before. So there was really no opportunity to review that, no consultation. Uh, the law firm Maddox um, completed that PIA via the Department of Health. The technical details were not released at that time. Some were later, not all of them. Uh, and, and again, none of this was released uh, before the app. So then on the day that the app was released, um, although I do think this was in preparation slightly before it was the app was re released, an open letter was um, uh, released and this was signed by 99 academic and technical experts. I believe this was led by researchers at University of Melbourne. Certainly um, Sulek Dreyfus and Kobe Lyons contacted me about it on that Sunday, I remember. Um, but this open letter called for um, again, the open publication of source code, design specification and testing results before the app is released, um, time for the international community of technical experts uh, to examine the software code and documentation, um, to adopt the recommendations from the open community of experts and to only ask people to download an app which provides the highest level of privacy and security protection. So again, none of this happened before the app was released, although the, the open letter was again, very only made public uh, on the same day uh, that the app was. So it's very difficult, I think, to have these processes of accountability and consultation and review uh, in states of emergency uh, when things are moving so very, very fast. Okay, moving on to the next one. 
A third open letter series of recommendations were made by the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network or ACAN, also in coalition with a number of other community groups is listed on the image on the slides. Uh, indeed, also including the Australian Privacy Foundation. And so this uh, open letter and recommendations emerged from a collective teleconference that we had uh, on the 28th of April, so two days after the app was released. And there was a series of representatives uh, of these community groups and other individuals on that call. So the open letter is available on ACAN's website and it makes a series of calls for improved public education and information for all communities. And I think that's important given some of the research that's starting to be published around um, misunderstandings of what the app does and so forth. Uh, acknowledgement of the digital divide and limitations of the app improved accessibility features to assist people with disability, arrangements to ensure the app will remain voluntary, uh, attending to outstanding privacy issues, uh, and noting this was in relation to the, determin the biosecurity determination and the, the um, legislative framework and the Privacy Amendment Act had not been introduced at this stage, um, and also transparency in auditing, uh, audit reporting and regulatory oversight. So I think that this shows the recommendations from ACAN and the wider coalition of community groups are much broader than those advocated by the Australian Privacy Foundation on its own and also the, the group of uh, academic and technical experts. And I think this is reflective of the various groups and representatives that were involved in this conversation. I'm going to return to some of these points later in my talk, as I believe they relate to issues, important issues of social and data justice, but I want to highlight the importance and education and information uh, for all communities and issues of digital divide uh, in particular. All right. So as you can see, just from those three calls and open letters that were made in response um, or in the lead up to the app being released, a lot of focus has been on releasing the source code of the app as a way to increase transparency and trust in the Australian government. So initial promises were made to release the source code. This did not occur until after the COVID Safe app was released, not before. Uh, so there was millions of people who had this app on their phones and the source code had, had not been released. Um, as, as the numerous uh, open letters and had called for was to release it before the app. Uh, the Digital Transformation Agency, DTA, uh, they released the app source code uh, just over 11 days ago on the 11th of April. They released it on GitHub and you can access it there. Um, but uh, they released it, the source code only for the app, not the National Information Storage System. And the DTA advised that they did not do so, and quoting here from the advice on that website, to ensure the privacy of individuals and integrity of the overall system, the code that relates to the COVID safe national information storage system will not be uh, released. So this re relates I think, to, to the back end of the system where the important I think, decryption work and of the contact information occurs. So in effect, we now have some partial transparency of the code, but it's not complete. Um, with that said, I just wanted to raise the question, you know, even if all of the code was released, would this address issues of trust or other concerns that relate to the system, the surveillance system, not just the app? Um, would we be able to understand its operation in entirety as a surveillance system that consists of many different parts that operate in many different contexts? I'm not sure that releasing the code uh, is actually the panacea here and that there are a set of broader concerns that should be uh, raised and considered, which is what I'm aiming to do today. So in raising these broader issues um, and drawing or connecting to the critical literature and algorithmic transparency in particular, much work has been done in this area over the preceding few years, uh, specifically aligned with the rise of artificial intelligence, algorithmic profiling and automated decision-making and international regulatory framework, such as the general data protection regulation, specifically some of the associated transparency provisions uh, and the so-called right to explanation under, under the GDPR. So I wanna draw a, a, just a general connection to these arguments and those that are being made in relation to COVID safe app and the source code transparency um, for the app, but also the national data store. So for example, um, legal academics, uh, Lillian Edwards, a legal academic, Michael Vay, ML specialist, machine learning specialists, 
argue that algorithmic transparency is a fallacy in terms of achieving um, meaningful explanations in machine learning and AI systems. They also connect this to the notion of meaningless consent that perhaps many of us will be familiar with when we click on a box to agree to data collection to obtain access to a service. Others argue that transparency is only meaningful if there's a critical audience uh, to be transparent to. As regards to COVID Safe App, there, there certainly is a critical audience of technical experts, academics and others who have been keen to reverse engineer and digest the code. We saw a panel of technical experts do this uh, with uh, Troy Hunt, Troy Hunt uh, the, the founder of Have I Been Pawned, uh, along with others. Um, but yet, I think we should also question what this means for a lay person considering um, downloading the app onto their phone and their understanding. Others uh, contend that transparency does not constitute accountability in and of itself because automated systems, and I'm quoting here, are contextual and relational as they perform tasks in collaboration with data, technologies and people under varying conditions. So there is both um, technical and contextual complexity at play. And that is we should aim to understand the wider system and interactions in context. And Annie and Crawford, so Mike Annie and Kate Crawford, uh, quite powerfully outline a series of failings of transparency, including disconnection from power and advancing neoliberal um, modes of agency. So putting this onto an individual, um, both of which are, I think, especially relevant in the context of the context of the COVID Safe app. The other critiques are that transparency can actually be harmful. It can create opacity or resistant transparency or intentional occlusion. Transparency can create false binaries between complete secrecy and total openness. Transparency does not necessarily build trust. I think that's an important one to reflect on. Transparency entails professional boundary work. It can privilege seeing over understanding, has technical limitations and also temporal limitations. So they argue, and I'm quoting here, that rather than privileging a type of accountability that needs to look inside systems, that we instead hold systems accountable by looking across them, seeing them as socio-technical systems that do not contain complexity, but enact complexity by connecting to and intertwining with assemblages of humans and non-humans. So here we start to see these STS uh, critiques uh, come through. So I just wanted to emphasize this, I'm certainly not saying, this is not to say that transparency is unimportant, but rather that it may or has the potential to assure understanding of algorithms and also applications as embedded, as embedded within institutions that have their own politics, their own investments and their own power plays too. And we need to focus also, or at least a bit more, uh, on some of these more socio and political dimensions. So in raising um, these points, there's also some interesting literature that connects, I think, from the perspective of algorithmic bias uh, as well, uh, in relation specifically to techno-determinism. So Torin, Torin Monaghan has argued that the focus on transparency reinforces this techno-determinism, de techno-deterministic fetishism, fetishism, sorry, God that manifests in the pleasurable pursuit of opening the black box, discovering the hidden code inside, exploring its beauty and flaws and explicating its intricacies. This was a fantastic editorial um, of Surveillance and Society and I would suggest uh, interested readers um, read that. Uh, and the argument here is that focusing on technology and opening the black box um, occurs perhaps at the expense of other important considerations in terms of harm, harmful impacts and discrimination and again in a social and political context. I think this also relates to a critique mounted by Julia Powles and Helen Nissenbaum. They published this in a Medium uh, blog post at the end of 2018 concerning the seductive nature of solving bias in AI systems. They argue that that actually may be missing the point entirely and I quote, it detracts from bigger more pressing questions. And this is because, and I love this quote uh, that I've put on the slide here, we are being spun potent stories that drive towards widespread reliance on regressive surveillance-based classification systems that list us all in unprecedented societal experiment from which it is difficult to return. Now more than ever, we need a robust, bold, imaginative response. And they argue that this focus on um, solving or kind of addressing sort of issues of bias through a technical perspective 
actually becomes an argument um, to optimise systems, to address these issues, we, you know, we, we actually result in sort of a perfect surveillance system if we uh, take this approach. So these related lines of critique connect to the work of Morozov on technological solutionism, uh, the, the 2013 a book, but also a recent um, column that was published uh, in relation to COVID surveillance in The Guardian, uh, and the assumption or perhaps obsession that technology is the solution to every societal problem. So rather than defaulting to technology as the solution, perhaps we need to step back and question, well, why are they not alternatives? Are there alternatives? Uh, and he, he terms this, you know, the search for post-solutionism. Uh, and what would a post-solutionist response look like? And what would it look like in this context? Uh, in turn, I think this also relates to arguments uh, for decentering technology uh, and the recognition of technology being subordinate to other political problems and broader structural issues. Again, emphasizing the need to be attentive to non-technological dimensions and socio-political socio contexts. So Pena, Gengaran and Nicholas argue, and again, I'm quoting, that the politics of data, connect, data collection connect to the reproduction of broader injustices. Data or technology which supports data collection regimes connect to broader social problems and that decentering technology requires that we probe the larger contexts that motivate technological projects, their development and use. So I wanna use this opportunity to question and be critical of not only techno-solutionist responses uh, to the COVID pandemic, but also our critique of them uh, as academics. Uh, and that's my main aim in this talk. Uh, and that's where I've noticed the gap in terms of the extant debate um, that's largely focused on transparency um, of the number of downloads of COVID, uh, the COVID Safe app, of the transparency of the source code, um, of now the transparency of the National Data Store source code. I think rather than the, considering this as a form of a broader technologies of governance in a very Foucauldian sense, uh, considering some things such as neoliberal political rationalities, new forms of new public management, digital era governance, these aims for efficiency through digital technology irrespective of the casualties. Uh, and in having kind of this conversation and getting some feedback on, on my talk today, um, my colleague, my Deakin criminology colleague, Ian Warren, also reminded me that the issues of measurement and quantification, that is biopolitics, have very much been embedded in the COVID counting exercise. Uh, and potentially, you know, the use of technology in driving this in a, a technology driven counting solution uh, to a problem that is much more complex uh, and perhaps needs better social responses um, than downloading an app. All right, and then this takes me um, to issues of social justice and the work of the Data Justice Lab uh, led by Lena Densick at Cardiff University. So um, Densick and colleagues argue for the need to scrutinize the interests and power relations at play in datafied societies. Uh, that enfranchise some and disenfranchise others, also hiding, highlighting forms of exclusion and discrimination. So I think we have to be mindful of the Australian context uh, here as well. Uh, there is a long-standing history of over-policing uh, and surveillance um, of some groups in particular, resulting in distrust of uh, authorities. And I see, and I posted an image here taken from ABC News a couple of days ago in relation to tensions uh, in Tennant Creek with, um, you know, police enforcement of coronavirus uh, lockdowns and measures uh, in particular in Indigenous communities. Uh, I think it's also important to recognise that some groups may be dis or advantaged or discriminated against uh, and the various ways that this may occur via the adoption or not uh, of this proposed solution to the problem. Um, so for example, you know, you need to have a new smartphone uh, ownership of that smartphone in particular, where people quite frequently share phones, there's issues of internet access. Um, it's worth, again, I think just emphasizing mobile data and such technology is not free. Um, mobile coverage is limited in rural areas. Um, but also, I think a range of other factors, um, and these were all highlighted by the ACAN Open 
letter in relation to um, experiencing or being a, a survivor of domestic violence, having a disability and so forth. So there's a whole range of issues here that I think um, require greater attention when we start to think about this application. Again, this relates to some of um, Tor and Monaghan's other work, specifically concerning marginalising surveillance and regulating conditions of objection. Uh, in, that, and th in that piece, he examines issues of homelessness and women's shelters in particular. I think really consideration of the different ways that some groups experience surveillance, and then I would add, and the outcomes uh, of it perhaps. In the COVID context, um, again, points raised in the ACAN teleconference and the open call that uh, emerged from that, um, particularly issues of digital divide uh, as, a as a limitation to the effectiveness of the app uh, and issues of accessibility, uh, for example, people with disabilities in some parts of the community, um, particularly those that live in rural and regional areas. So I think we need to think about surveillance and surveillance of disadvantage in terms of where also consideration of perhaps current COVID clusters are occurring or with regard um, to certain employment context, at least in Victoria, where we've seen the recent clusters and outbreaks, specifically in abattoirs and meat, meat packing professions and fast food restaurants we've seen as well. So the point that I just want to make here um, and this is not to take away from these other critiques that have been mounted, but I think we need to also be consider considerate of this as well, is that it is not only um, about privacy and it's not only about transparency. There are a range of other important considerations that we, we should not overlook um, at the expense of privacy or transparency. So there are clear issues of social justice, of equity, of disadvantage, uh, especially as it relates to coercive surveillance and structures of social control and also the public benefits that may or may not flow from those that use the app or those who cannot for whatever reason. And so that's a, a, just a really key point that I wanted to make in this talk. All right, so <laughs> COVID-19 surveillance. Certainly 2020 is reading like the op opening pages of a dystopian science fiction novel. Uh, and before concluding, I just wanted to place some evidence that COVID safe, or place some emphasis, I should say, that co the COVID safe app uh, is but one piece of a much larger surveillance puzzle or response to the global pandemic. Um, there are many examples internationally and um, Privacy International, uh, the UK outfit, have been cataloguing these uh, and you can access the, the um, a database of all of the surveillance developments and responses that have been occurring. I think that's a very useful resource for individuals doing research in this area and the link is on the slide. Um, a recent article uh, by which was published um, by Joan Wong uh, in The Economist uh, was concerned creating the Coronopticon. I love that word, the Corona Coronopticon. <laughs> And that overviews various applications of surveillance technologies in response to the COVID-19 pa pandemic, including um, quarantine enforcement, indeed contact tracing and the various forms that this is being adopted, top down, bottom up, geolocation, Bluetooth, et cetera, flow modeling, social graph making. Uh, and it really shows that there is a broad range of approaches uh, in terms of the responses and uh, forms of COVID-19 surveillance. And many of these also include private companies as well, um, whether they be collecting information and sharing that information with um, state officials, governments and so forth. Uh, so again, here we see Morozov in the recent Guardian column on this uh, issue in terms of technological solutionism in the COVID-19 context and specifically surveillance, cautions, um, this crisis will entrench the solutionist toolkit as the default option for addressing all of our other existential problems um, and that it's easier than addressing root causes, structural or political uh, issues uh, and certainly not to add to anyone's stress or kind of anxiety or depression in the, in the current context, but there are many other existential problems that we are facing as a society and the, the, the next immediate one that certainly springs to mind is that of the climate crisis. So I think being cognizant of this as well. Uh, in the Australian context, we've seen many other 
um, applications of surveillance technology in response to COVID or in response to some of the problems or issues that COVID have, have created. So we saw New South Wales Police using automated number plate recognition technology uh, over the Easter period to identify whether or not people were in the, where they were meant to be or where their cars were registered in terms of their registered address. We've seen surveillance of students um, through uh, monitoring in terms of invigilation of remote exams as well. And again, private companies being very uh, invested in developing and peddling this technology to universities. We've seen the sharing of data from telecoms providers. So Vodafone provided telecoms information to the government in terms of um, the spread of COVID. We see uh, biometrics, Clearview AI back on, the, back on the agenda here, and also the development of drones that monitor uh, individuals with COVID symptoms. So there's a lot happening, I think, and COVID Safe app is, I think, just one, uh, one piece of this puzzle. And again, um, uh, connecting this back to the literature or the field of critical surveillance studies. I really like this quote. Uh, this was in a rapid response editorial of Surveillance and Society by Martin French and Torin Monaghan. Uh, they published it very quickly. I remember presenting this to my students in, in week two um, uh, when I was lecturing to an empty theatre before lockdowns occurred. Uh, this, this draws attention, I think, to the historical socio-cultural constructions of insecurity, vulnerability and risk, in particular in response uh, and in terms of governing insecurity and in this context, um, bio insecurity. Uh, and I think it's also important that this highlights some of the social divisions um, in social media or indeed the popular media. I mean, this screenshot I've taken from a recent article in off news.com.au. Uh, that are emerging as a result of the moralizing discourse around those that do or do not use the app and fear of the disease. So we are seeing some labeling of those who refuse perhaps to download the COVID safe app as anti-vaxxers in the media because of the fear of infection and resistance uh, to the app as well. So this kind of fear as being really an important mediating and moralizing uh, aspect. Okay. So finally, I just wanted to put this in a broader context as well, not only in the COVID surveillance context, but the Australian surveillance architecture that we have. COVID safe, uh, in my view, should be kind of examined and considered against a backdrop of an extensive government run surveillance architecture rather than as an individual or single development in one point of time, however extraordinary. Uh, and I think taken together, all of these successive developments operate to expand the ways in which the government monitors and has power to monitor citizens and intrude into their private lives. And this is in the last five years alone. And I've used that as the cutoff as that's very much been the time period of my advocate uh, kind of career in response to each of these successive issues in relation to the introduction of mandatory metadata retention legislation, the 2016 census, the um, very appalling uh, robo debt situation where we have uh, a large class action uh, emerging concerning you know, 400,000 individuals targeted by the Australian government with false debts. Um, the My Health record, the introduction of a uh, legislation to undermine encrypted forms of communication, the ramping up and expansion of, of a, a national facial biometrics matching capability, uh, raids on journalists, we saw at the ABC and also Annika Smythurst. 2020, we've already seen the use of Clearview AI, um, law enforcement dishonesty about the use of Clearview AI, which was only revealed when Clearview AI was hacked and, and suffered a data breach, uh, and now COVID safe. I mean, I think, where is this going? Where are we going 2021 onwards? So I think each of these individual developments should be considered collectively and quite seriously, especially when we're thinking about matters of trust and transparency in government surveillance practices. There is a well-established uh, track record that we must be cognizant of. Uh, and this is especially significant given the absence of fundamental privacy rights, indeed enforceable human rights uh, in Australia at the federal level. So we should take a step back uh, and view this as a wider architecture of surveillance that's never rolled back. It's constantly expanded, constantly expanded and the entrenchment of these surveillance structures uh, with ongoing scope creep. And again, as Morozov would argue, entrenched solutionism with technology and specifically surveillance technology being implemented 
uh, as the response to social problems, insecurity in particular around terrorism and so forth, but also in other realms of public administration, such as the, the census, such as welfare administration, such as health record management. So this contributes to a cycle of control magnified by the cycle of fear of the pandemic and others or other threats to security that, that's been generated. Um, and so we accept, or we may tend to accept some incursions into our rights, including that of privacy, but not only privacy. So in turn, all of this contributes to a wider normalization of surveillance in society. Uh, and I question, you know, what will the response be in response, you know, say COVID 2023 or any subsequent wave of the virus? I mean, I think we need to think about what this means moving forward. Uh, and indeed also what about the expansion of such approaches or contract, contact tracing applications to other infectious diseases uh, as well. Okay, so what? <laughs> so this is a call, my talk today is a call for critical surveillance scholars and others to situate these developments in broader contexts, broader systems and architectures of surveillance, consider the political rationalities uh, and technologies of governance rather than technologies in, in and of themselves. So this means we need to consider the, the, the discursive, constructive and, and justificatory elements that support the introduction of technology uh, and support also its legal framework and in turn how they operate to influence and shape the design and deployment of both technology and law. So it becomes quite a meta critique here. We need to interrogate in doing this, we need to interrogate the power plays, I think by government and also technology companies as well, as we see they have their own investments. Um, that are aimed at trying to protect communities, although they're doing it through new forms of surveillance. Um, and so we must consider these broader contexts of surveillance and also to decenter technology, both in terms of the technological like solutionist approaches to the COVID pandemic and our critique of them. Uh, and this really, I think, requires examination of the po political architecture, uh, the rationalities of governance that give rise to the use of new ICTs as a solution to every new problem. And we need to question what are alternatives in, in terms of the design and deployment uh, and with regard to the varied potential impacts for social and, just and data justice as well. So <laughs> I wanted to end on a positive note <laughs> because I know that these are trying times and challenging times um, for a lot of people and I don't wanna be you know, too, too depressing and dystopian. Um, and I think one of the positive dimensions or one of the positive aspects that has come out of particularly the COVID Safe app actually is the recognition uh, for the need for enhanced protections for privacy. And we've seen this in terms of um, the legal framework that's been introduced in relation to criminal penalties um, for misuse of information and so forth. I think that's a really positive development, this recognition uh, that um, there needs to be kind of strengthened measures uh, to uh, increase uh, trust. Um, obviously, this is happening so people are encouraged to, to download the app. And, you know, perhaps the Australian government is learning from their succession of previous data omni shambles. Um, but, but also importantly, quite significantly, what this shows, this recognition that they need to strengthen privacy protections to uh, garner public trust, shows existing problems and deficiencies. Uh, with uh, privacy protections that require wholesale reform. Um, and I do note that a review of the Privacy Act has been slated uh, to occur later this year, uh, and that this should happen not only in the context when the Australian government is attempting to secure trust and get people to download the app, but always. And so on that note, I will end. Here are the references that I have cited, and uh, I will now take any questions. Cool. Thank you, Monique. Do you want to just take your um, slideshow down or stop screen sharing? So we've got a slight delay in the, um, uh, the between our Zoom chat and the YouTube chat. So I'll start us off with a question first, but I can see questions rolling in now. Um, so I guess I just wanted to come back to that idea of sort of the normalisation of surveillance um, and to sort of wonder if it's worth differentiating one of the key sort of common critiques we're seeing at the moment popping out, which is, um, uh, you know, I already use Facebook, so then what's the difference? Or I already use Twitter already. I'm already implicated within sort of certain structures of architectures of surveillance. So what's the difference between sort of one more point okay, of surveillance? Right. 
Good question. Sorry, I was just getting a bit distracted by the chat window that popped up. I mean, good question. I think arguments that we are already surveilled, so just download the COVID safe app, <laughs> are dangerous. Um, we should certainly treat um, Facebook, Google and the surveillance capitalists with great caution. Uh, they track, monitor, surveil you for various ends, even more, or, you know, more so than not, to develop a profile of you in order to target advertising at you and sell you something. Um, but despite perhaps some of the ambitions of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, these platforms are not governments. They do not have authority uh, to police restrictions. They do not have the power to suspend or garnish welfare payments or exercise other forms of formal social control. And there are greater implications for liberties and freedoms when it comes to governments and government systems of surveillance than private companies and platforms. That is not to say, however, that they don't work together and share information. We, all, we know they certainly do. This was revealed in particular by Snowden's revelations in relation to the PRISM program. Um, we have an, you know, kind of an invisible handshake or hand in glove relationship. Irrespective of this, what we should be doing is resisting the exploitation of our personal information for capitalist surveillance ends. And also, as I've just argued, interrogate the power plays by government aimed at trying to protect communities through new forms of surveillance. Okay. Well, that actually rolls in quite nicely with sort of our first question coming through on YouTube chat. And this is from Marcus Foss. Hi, um, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> so he's um, uh, bringing up uh, covered stuff in the context of, of larger debates around smart cities, and in particular, um, Naomi Klein, I assume we're talking about sort of the shock doctrine here. So he's asking sort of what is your take on the wider implications vis a vis surveillance capitalism? You know, is there a way forward? Um, he's, and he's asking about data sovereignty, for instance. So um, Marcus Voss and I, uh, along with our colleagues, um, Peter and Arena, actually just had an article accepted today, <laughs> yay, uh, on the topic of technological sovereignty and uh, really going to the kind of points of, well, how do we ensure that individuals have autonomy and control over their personal information? Um, how can we kind of engage um, individuals and communities to be involved in the decisions that are being made about um, these developments in technologies and also I think the exploitation of individual uh, personal information by governance, governments but also by technology companies and we look at this through the example of the sidewalk um, labs development, um, uh, smart city development. And here we argue, I mean, really for a greater focus uh, on these factors, increasing uh, individual autonomy and involvement uh, and enhancing forms of technological sovereignty in a meaningful way, a more meaningful way than uh, what we argue is social license to operate kind of washing in this context. So we're, this also connects to some other work that we've been doing in relation to data care and thinking about, well, how can we, how can we build solutions or how can we enhance uh, individual autonomy in various ways, including through the use of technology, um, but also elsewhere as well through other kind of non-technological solutionist approaches. So I think that, that that's a really important point and certainly connects to kind of some of our ongoing work in this area. Awesome. Um, we've got another question. I apologize for mispronouncing your name, uh, Liria Bennett which is to what extent is COVID safe different to the other Australian government forms of surveillance? I think the government seems to be trying on privacy, HR, transparency in terms of the evolution of legislation. So um, I think she's saying, so it's maybe imperfect, but it's better than others. Mm. And so hi, Liria Bennett-Moses, <laughs> also from UNSW um, mm. Allen's Hub. I think that's a really good question. And I think in the point that I raised that there have been a lot, some positives, I think, come from, from the development of the COVID Safe app and the legal framework around it in that they are attempting, I think, to garner trust in various ways. Um, and so in that sense, you know, there are some key, key differences uh, here than what we've seen uh, else, elsewhere. Um, but there are also, I think, some sim similarities in terms of things like you know, bipartisan support. Uh, there are, again, those questions that I've been raising in relation to sort of limited transparency in relation to their justification and so forth. But I think that we may be kind of moving into a different, a different kind of realm or a different a kind of trajectory with, I mean, perhaps the Australian government learning from some of their previous failures. Uh, and I think focusing on more kind of gaining trust of the public. And in, and in that sense, I think that that's kind of the positive to take away from this. Yeah, and that flows in sort of 
um, almost naturally really with our next questions from Radhika Garor, you know, is it is the issue more fundamentally one just of a lack of trust and trustworthiness between governments and people? That's a good question. Um, I mean, trust, I think, is a very complex and complicated kind of concept as well, and trustworthiness. Uh, this was this is actually the theme of the last Association of Internet Researchers conference held in Brisbane last year, tr trust, trust in the system. I think it's certainly kind of a dimension that it, it is a dimension of it, but I don't think it's the only one. And I think that it connects to um, some of the other broader data justice and social justice issues that I've raised, perhaps even in terms of individual understanding, um, accessibility and, and, and so forth. Um, a few requests for my slides. Yes, they can just email me directly and I'll send them through. I think that there's a lot going on here um, and there are remain open a number of important empirical questions and as academics we certainly have our um, work cut out for us I think analysing all of this with the benefit of hindsight which has been quite difficult I think even in preparing for this talk um, that these things are happening so quickly um, and there are some surveys and preliminary results coming forward or being published through, you know, not in academic journals as yet, but on social uh, SSRN and the conversation is publishing some of this, you know, that shows, you know, why people are and aren't downloading the app, um, their understandings of various dimensions of it. So in that conversation article that I uh, discussed earlier by the team at Melbourne, I mean, the, the reason from the top of my head that people were not um, deciding to download the app. I think 30% of individuals raised some concerns about trust and privacy. So I think that this is really, again, um, a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I mean, I guess I've also been hesitant to avoid perhaps some of the disaster capitalism in terms of, um, you know, focusing on, you know, COVID surveillance and so forth, but also in complete recognition that this is really important for our scholarly community to address these sorts of issues and analyse this. Uh, and, and also with the benefit of hindsight, I think. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It's sort of, um, it's necessary to do this critique now, but I'll also acknowledge that you two are caught in a crisis. Um, and we already see sort of so much, so many disparities in terms of publication and who is publishing right now and who has the time to, to do important research and the kind of knock-on effects that'll have for our industry. Mm -hmm. um, um, but we've got a, another question come through. Uh, so how do we balance questions of privacy and questions of safety? So although low circulating SES people um, usually are over surveilled, in this case, they're excluded by the digital divide then. And that's the point that I wanted to make in terms of a lot of the literature, particularly in um, the surveillance field, critical surveillance studies has focused on the kind of over surveilling mm -hmm. of certain populations and groups. But in this instance, perhaps the, the public health benefits may or may not flow to the, these groups as well. So I think that that's kind of an interesting second take on that on that focus of marginalizing surveillance. People experience surveillance is not applied equally in the population. Uh, and that, I think that's a really key point and the outcomes of that will differ. I think in terms of questions of balancing more broadly, and we see this a lot in relation to privacy security balancing and here now public safety, public health, privacy balancing, I don't think necessarily that this is a zero sum game. I don't think that these things have to uh, exist in a, a way that's diametrically opposed. And then perhaps that connects back to the, the project of um, QUT colleagues and I, Marcus Foth and others in relation to, well, how do we think about these um, how do we think about this in a way that empowers uh, communities, empowers individuals? I mean, how do we have good data practices that actually, I mean, enhances justice, that, that uh, elevates the position of those that are most marginalised in society, a very Rawlsian, I think, conception of, of justice. So I think that, that that's where a lot of future work really needs to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's already talk of sort of, I suppose, uh, one's ability to opt in into surveillance as being a passport, right? So it's sort of, um, um, you know, you either get the green light to go and travel if you download the app, if you allow certain like levels of protection surveillance, um, which is which is not the not well, the good that, data justice. Been, I think that's been slated or there's been some discussion about this in the EU context in relation to having sort of a digital passport or COVID passport um, but I, I think these developments are unfolding and we, we should just be um, very 
mindful and continue to watch them. And again, it, it's really difficult, I think, to do this in the midst of the pandemic and maybe with time and with hindsight, some of this, some of these dynamics will be made much clearer. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a question from Declan Cush from Union New South Wales. Yeah. Um, could you speak a bit more to the possible darker discrimination scenarios? So he's thinking specifically about welfare implications, for example, having payments stopped without the app. Um, so first of all, hi Declan, uh, great to have you in this virtual um, environment. I, I also wanted to say Declan had a fantastic tweet in concerning his downloading of the app, which was a picture of him uh, removing his notebook from his drawer and writing his contact <laughs> <laughs> manually on it. I loved that so much, Declan, I thought it was great. Uh, look, I think in terms of this, the COVID Safe app in particular, they have implemented protection saying that the, the data can only be used um, for the purposes of contact tracing, and that's very important with cr criminal penalties five years in jail. So that's not what is occurring. Um, but that's not to say that that can, can't change moving forward. And certainly the way in which we've seen the Australian government particularly being um, very punitive uh, towards certain parts of um, the community, in particular those uh, in receipt of welfare benefits, is something that I would be uh, just concerned about if we start thinking about possible applications. Mm. Well, that kind of leads nicely, I suppose, into another question that I had around um, what you might call sort of the outsourcing privatisation uh, of contact tracing. You mentioned PwC um, and, the, and, the, and the use of them in particular workplaces, for instance, or, or uh, education institutions, and the kind of, I suppose, function creep that enables. So PwC sort of is called check-in um, and they're already marketing it. But one of the main things that it does promote is like you can you can boost productivity of your workers, which has nothing to do with contact tracing, which has nothing to do with public health. And yet it's sort of part of the, the mechanisms um, that they're sort of latching on to this public health crisis. Um, so I guess that's a question that has a lot to do with the normalization of surveillance. It has a lot to do uh, with, with, with different permutations of contact tracing apps that we might see. Mm. And I think raising a very key point that you have, um, you know, limitations or various limitations in the COVID safe app, but there are other, I guess, developments where we see private companies developing their own uh, forms of this as well and other forms of work, workplace surveillance, not only limited to contact tracing. And I think the point you made in relation to productivity is a key one. Um, and I think that connects back to these kind of broader, I think, neoliberal rationalities supporting surveillance structures. And um, that was certainly the case when we think about um, robo debt, uh, sort of the neoliberal kind of justifications for this in terms of uh, efficiency and reductions in welfare spending and so forth. Uh, but when we see it applied elsewhere uh, is, is, I think, quite concerning. Uh, and the, the impact that this will have on workers or indeed on students, I mean, the involvement of, I think, Protractor U and other private companies in developing uh, forms of um, video surveillance technologies and also biometric surveillance technologies in terms of keyboard uh, keystroke dynamics and so forth and marketing those as well as a solution. I think that it shows that there are a lot of invested parties um, in, in some of these technologies and, and approaches and again real, real risk here of scope and function creep across the board and this all fits into a broader pattern that we've seen uh, not only in specifically the surveillance surveillance of COVID-19 context. And again, I would refer individuals to the um, Privacy International database that catalogues all of these, but also just in a, in a historical context as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, uh, something that was brought up in the live chat actually, um, is a lot of people sort of following hashtags of, you know, what is the community concerned about when it comes to um, the contact tracing app and COVID safe. And there was a lot of sort of kickback against Amazon specifically. Um, I wonder if you had any thoughts of that. Um, I mean, my initial thoughts on that is that it has, it's like more anti-Bezos <laughs> and we have sort of like, you know, someone becoming a trillionaire in the age of so many people losing employment, which is all kind of coming back. So everything is, Amazon is poisoned by that, in that sense. But are there more sort of specific critiques of Amazon you could make rather than just an anti-Bezos thing? 
Well, it also, I think, goes to this broader uh, investment and infrastructures of US kind of tech companies. And they're, they're also entrenchment as well in many kind of facets of our life. And they're also extreme power. You know, these these companies have you know, greater like GDP than countries. Um, you know, their, their ability to not only police and surveil their own employees, but then also, you know, um, the reliance of our governments and the reliance uh, of us as citizens on them, I think. And we've seen, I recently read um, a, kind of an article in relation to Uber, Uber suspending a series of accounts, I think in the US or Mexico, where an individual had come into contact with COVID. Um, and, you know, this puts people out of work. Uh, and so we do have this, um, I think, real kind of structural issue here, uh, and, and specifically as it relates to individuals in the gig economy as well. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess I should have tied my question around workplace surveillance with the full knowledge that there are workplaces that are plenty surveilled at the moment. Um, you know, particularly if you work in a call centre, you would know that. If you were to do anything to do with the gig economy, you would know that. Um, but then sort of ironically, I suppose it's that very infrastructure that has allowed people to do certain contact tracing, for example, you know, there's a delivery driver for a McDonald's here who was, um, who was sort of traced to sort of 12 different McDonald's outlets and they've all had to close, um, mm. which probably wouldn't have been, been possible without all of that, which, yeah, as you say, it's a problem when it's located within the broad infrastructure. That is a gig economy that does not have sick leave for people, that does not have... Um, uh, any way to support people outside of like, well, you either get to go, you have access or you don't have access. Um, you either get a green light or you don't. You're a public nuisance or you're not. And it, indeed, the same critique could equally be applied to universities and the casualisation of our workforce. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, the moralisation, I guess, um, in particular of like, you know, why did these people go to work? I'm like, it's quite obvious why people go to work when they're still getting tested or when they're sick or whatever, because I don't yeah. have any other option. Um, well, so I've come a number of comments in chat that I'm just going to respond to. And actually, I think that they're, they're connected. Um, so again, I'm not a technical person. And I do know that there have been technical experts who have gone through or reverse engineered, but then also looked at the source code and identified a series of issues and, and bugs in the, the, the app, including leaving Tasmania uh, out of it. <laughs> that was quite a funny one that I saw on Twitter. Um, what the implications for having obvious cybersecurity problems and not fixing them fast enough is significant. I mean, we have real issues of information security and certainly just, um, I think it was last week or the week before, uh, Paul Karp from The Guardian called me in relation to a massive data breach at Home Affairs with, I think it was 750,000 um, skilled migrants, uh, personal information just being put on the website, not even uh, like no requirement for re-identification, just publicly available. And that also goes, I think, to Lyria's comment, which I think is quite a good one. I mean... Amazon perhaps and big tech companies are maybe more competent than government because we've certainly seen a succession of um, uh, leaks and issues of re-identification of information in particular that they've been that's been publicly made available. And so I think that you know in some respects maybe the tech companies do have kind of greater capacity to do this stuff. But also again going to this issue of outsourcing, issue of outsourcing. Um, government systems and services to the private sector rather than developing those capabilities within the government themselves. And I think even since the 2014, you know, Productivity Commission inquiry um, in the, the federal government uh, under Tony Abbott, we saw really like massive cuts to public sector. And, and this has really, again, been aligned with a, a neoliberal trajectory of government to reduce um, the, the public service and outsource all of this stuff. And so perhaps maybe if it was a, a different context or situation where you know, we were developing capabilities within government, uh, it wouldn't be the case. Mm, mm. Um, that, that ties in almost the, perfectly with Richard Nelson's comment here, um, which is, you know, given we don't know the efficacy of tech solving this, as you discussed, you personally think the trade-offs here are worth the experiment? It is an experiment and we don't have the benefit of hindsight. Um, and so it's a really difficult one and we don't really have the details. I mean, I couldn't even locate readily how many people have downloaded the app or indeed how, you know, we don't know. Uh, we, we just don't know. And I think we have to be cautious uh, in, in, in making that assessment. Uh, we don't know whether or not 
um, the incursions that are being asked of us, um, you know, will even be effective in achieving the stated, the stated and legitimate aims, the legitimate aims of the protection of public health. So I don't want to get lost in that, but mm. I can't answer that question because there is no evidence. Mm. Mm. Not yet. <laughs> mm. Um, well, we haven't got any more um, questions come through on the chat just yet. Um, so I suppose, I mean, are there other, are there people working in this? You, you had such an extensive, and I really think it's incredibly impressive, like a citation list. You know, are there sort of organisations, do you think, at the moment who are doing really good work that you would point to um, uh, for people to get that information? Can you say, you know, it's so hard to sort of collect this at the moment? There's no sort of centralised source to say, you know, where are the numbers coming out? I think at the international level, the resource that I suggested um, by that Privacy International have been compiling is a very good one. And I think that will be kind of a good foundation for future research, uh, looking at, at some of these developments as they're occurring um, and also comparatively thinking about the differences between jurisdictions and so forth. Um, within the Australian context, I mean, obviously, I'll just plug the work of the Australian Privacy Foundation, a very under-resourced uh, volunteer organisation <laughs> under many pressures, including um, those in relation to a lot of our board members being pre in precarious employment situations, as well as academics and sessional academics. Uh, but there are also a range of other important uh, organisations um, and civil liberties organisations as well. So in Victoria, we have Liberty Victoria in Queensland, the Queensland Council of uh, Civil Liberties at a national level. We have the Electronic Frontiers uh, Australia. And so there are a lot of groups uh, who have been very active and also um, ACAN has been very active, I think, in importantly drawing together a number of different representative and representatives from a number of different groups and I think that's why we see their recommendations as being I think much more considerate of uh, these issues as they impact um, certain parts of the community. Mm. Um, do you see the conversation happening here is very similar to the ones happening internationally? I mean, obviously the, the, the apps that are being brought out internationally are very different to the ones that we have here. You know, some are more mandatory than others, some are branded totally different, like the Trace Together one. Um, do you think that there's, uh, those differences have made a difference to how it's been adopted and so on? Again, that's very difficult to uh, address, but I think you can look at the, the curve where you see sort of the implications of certain things. But I just wanted to, again, emphasise that I don't think we can put this down to an app or one single approach. I think that this is, you know, much more broadly connected to various cultural and socio-political contexts uh, and local contexts of, the, of this and also, you know, the transmission of the virus in certain communities and the other responses that governments have taken. So, again, just kind of advocating for, like, not focusing only on the app and implications of the app, but viewing this in context uh, yeah. I think is really important. Uh, and so I know, you know, China has very much adopted a different approach. So has, you know, other, other nations uh, and the outcomes of this have, you know, been experienced differently. And again, these are all open empirical questions for researchers and academics working here. Okay. So we've got uh, a question on inter interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary, um, Interdisciplinarity. Yeah. Do you want me to read it out? Yeah, no, I can read it. Yeah, you're going. Yeah. I've got to, I'll flip for the benefit of those watching at home. <laughs> um, so we've got some great engagement uh, from app developers and security specialists on the chat. Um, and it's a question about, you know, how do criminologists and IT experts work together? You know, are there other social scientists and humanities disciplines um, that contribute to that field? You know, what about philosophy, for instance? Certainly. So um, in the Good Data book that, um, that I mentioned previously or that you read out in the introduction, that was a collaboration between myself as a criminologist, uh, Angela Daly as a legal expert, uh, and uh, Kate Devitt, a philosopher, actually. And also, Tal, this, connects, this question connects directly to our predictive policing project. I mean, do you want to speak a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, that is a project that is 
been run explicitly as um, an interdisciplinary project between HAS researchers and STEM researchers. So this is about predictive policing in Australia. Um, it has me, I'm a media and comms scholar, also STS, feminist STS scholar, Monique, who's criminology. Um, we've got um, Dermot, who's also criminology, Ian, who's also criminology. Um, but then we've also got the technical side. So folks at the artificial intelligence Institute at Deakin, A squared, I squared, um, Leonard Hoon, who's there. We've got people in cybersecurity and law as well. So I think um, by assembling that kind of interdisciplinary team, it's a way of acknowledging sort of like actually how complex a question like predictive policing is, which is more than just a technical question. Um, so we've got time for, I think, one last question. Um, this has come through from Tim Neal, which is um, about what other responses and interventions were contemplated by the government apart from an app. You know, there's contact tracing systems that is investigative teams that are not app based and are, if anything, even harder to trace or investigate than the app. Yeah, good question. It would be really nice if the Australian government like set forth their justification and rationale and their kind of the evidence that informed the decision making. Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe we can go or go to Declan's approach and just pull out our notebooks from our, <laughs> our desk drawers and just start writing down the names that we have contact, uh, individuals we have contact with. There's obviously limitations to that approach and there's also limitations to the approach that we have. So I think actually being quite clear about the evaluative criteria that's being made, being quite open about the justification and rationality for adopting certain solutions uh, is really important and that's not occurred. Mm. All right. Well, I think we might end, we'll try and end on a happy note if we can, if possible. So I've got sort of one last question, which is about like, actually, what are the good things that could come out of something like um, this crisis moment? Um, as you say, like laws change quickly as a result, but is there, is there a evidence, for instance, or is there any suggestion that actually, you know, legislation could be strengthened in this, um, in this moment that actually concerns that were previously raised that were never addressed are now getting raised um, and addressed quicker than they ever have? I think there's a real opportunity there, uh, particularly given that we have an upcoming review or the government um, have uh, committed of the, ba the base of an ACCC inquiry into digital platforms, have committed to a review of the Australian Privacy Act and I think that the lessons that we can draw perhaps from the COVID safe context uh, will be important, I think, in, in, in that process, in terms of submissions, writing submissions to that process uh, is, will be, I think, a key positive that will come from this, hopefully. And this is also, I think, aligned with other work that's been done um, by Edward Santo and the Australian Human Rights Commission and their project on technology and human rights. I think that, that this will also feed in and there'll be a series of roundtable that there has been already a series of roundtables and consultations that are ongoing. I think some of this will also feed into those discussions as well. So we may see greater um, protections in relation to human rights uh, and technology. Uh, certainly um, for academics as well, uh, with kind of being mindful of the um, disaster capitalism from an academic perspective, there are so many rich and meaty research questions for us, for our students um, and a cat, <laughs> Tao, um, that, we, that we can take up uh, and in our research agendas uh, and investigate moving forward from this with the, with the benefit of hindsight, I think, at the end of the crisis, uh, provided that we're all still employed. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a big proviso at the end there. Well, thank you so much, Monique. I think we might leave it there. Um, so before we go, I'll just say um, thank you to everyone who joined us in the YouTube chat and thank you for your excellent questions. If you want to get in touch with Monique, I think she's open to you emailing her directly. Yeah, just send me an email, um, monique.man at deacon.edu.au or reach out on Twitter at Dr Monique Mann. Yeah. Um, and before you go, I'll just share a promo slide for um, our next seminar, which is coming up next week. And this is our uh, a talk that's going to be delivered by Frederick Keck. So Frederick is the director of the Laboratory for Social Anthropology in Paris. He's co-editor of the book Anthropology for Epidemics and author of Avian Reservoirs, Virus Hunters, Birdwatchers in Chinese Sentinel Posts. And that's a book that I think has, you know, 
particularly vital insights for our current moment. You know, it examines the 2003 SARS outbreak um, and the public health responses in Taiwan, Singapore and Hong Kong. And it's out on Duke University Press. And that talk's going to go on the same time next, oh wait, at 2.30 p.m., slightly later time next week because he's joining us from Europe. Um, thank you again, Monique. Um, uh, and see you all next week. So we stop live.